and I want to present to you Professor Dominic de Ziegler. He was born in Nice, France, at the age of 30, before starting residence and fellowship training in UCLA. He took part in 1978 in the opening of a joint mission of ICRC of UNICEF in Cambodia. Professor De Ziegler trained in obstetric and endocrinology and infertility at University of California at Los Angeles. He became diplomat of the American Board of uh, OBGYN. He was subsequently an assistant professor at the University of New Jersey and uh, associated professor in reproductive endocrinology and fertility in Paris. Professor de Ziegler has authored uh, more than 230 articles and numerous book chapters in the field of uh, reproductive hormones, infertility and assisted reproductive technologies. After directing infertility and art at Geneva Hospital, he headed for the past 10 years the Division of Reproductive Endocrinology and Infertility at University Paris Descartes Cochin Hospital. Since June 2017, he has joined the team of Foch Hospital in Paris as a university consultant and professor emeritus. I want to make personal regard also to Professor uh, Ziegler from our previous meeting in Congress organized from UCSD in Coronado Island in San Diego. Please, Professor Ziegler. Hello, can you hear me well? Oh, I'm sorry you, you don't see me, uh, but you heard a long CV it indicates that I've been around for a long time and that I have gray hair, I confirmed it. Now, this being said, I now work uh, at the Hospital Foch and you have here the co-workers. Uh, one of them, Dr. Pietea, uh, is one of the most active young person in our group, and I congratulate him for the talk he gave yesterday at Facility and Sterility Journal Club on implantation failure. Please, on the next slide, you see, uh, could I have the next one? Next slide, please. Yeah. These are my disclosures, you can read them briefly. Okay. All right. This is the concept of endometriosis. What we're going to talk about now is endometriosis, which is a cause of infertility and actually uh, interferes with reproduction, natural and ART. And as we will see, uh, there are two different issues. The factors of endometriosis that alter fertility are uh, of three, are arranged in three categories and three territories. You have some in the pelvic cavity. In the pelvic cavity, what you have is an inflammation that leads to a toxic pelvic cavity effect. And this actually interferes with sperm oocyte interaction and expose the oocyte and the young embryo to the toxic effect of this environment. Uh, this actually interferes with natural conception. This is the mechanism by which uh, endometriosis interferes with natural conception. On the ovaries, endometriosis interferes mainly with the response to ovarian stimulation for IVF. And last but not least, endometriosis also alters endometrial receptivity. Now, you have to realize the differences between natural conception and IVF. In natural conception, the oocyte and the embryos are exposed to the toxic environment. In IVF, next slide, please. In IVF, what we actually do, we bypass the pelvic cavity. And uh, the oocyte is not exposed to the toxic effect, and the embryo goes directly into the uterus. So we bypass that. And I will show you that actually endometriosis does not interfere 
with ART outcome. This is the main uh, finding that I want to share with you. Could I have the next slide, please? Just to confirm uh, the uh, uh, data that I just showed you, uh, we conducted a study with a group of Richard Scott in the US. Next slide. This actually shows you the uh, unemployed rate of embryos with and without endometriosis in different age groups. The light blue one are the women with endometriosis and the dark blue one are the controls. And as you see, unemployed increases with age, but in each age group, there is no difference between the endometriosis and the control. So what you have is the quality of oocyte, the quality of embryos in, in uh, ART is not altered in case of endometriosis. And last, we will discuss about implantation and you'll be surprised by the results as well. Next slide. The medical treatment, uh, next slide. What you have to realize is the medical treatment is effective on pain and prevents recurrence of endometriosis after uh, surgery, but does not uh, act on fertility. Actually, all the treatments that we have, includes the agonist, the agonist and the ad bank, and uh, the pill, all of these treatments are contraceptive. So actually, the time passed on the treatment is time lost for reproduction. Therefore, medical treatment is effective for pain and preventing recurrence, ineffective for enhancing fertility. Next slide. Uh, after surgery, putting the patient on medical treatment has been attempted with the hope that it would help. It does not. The best time for conceiving after surgery is right after surgery. Why? Because surgery helps natural conception. As we will see, next slide. Uh, next slide. This is the work by uh, the group in Milan, uh, uh, Paolo Vercellini, which shows the natural conception after surgery. And natural conception, irrespective of the stage, the different curves represent different stages. Natural conception equals about 50% after 18 to 24 months. So you realize now that we have surgery helping natural conception, and we have medical treatment helping pain, but not helping conception. Now, we will see that surgery does not help IVF. It helps natural conception. So therefore, you really understand that for surgery to be helpful, the woman has to be given 18 months to 24 months for conceiving naturally. Otherwise, surgery is useless in terms of fertility. Surgery can ob obviously be indicated for pain, but that's a different issue. Next slide. Uh, this is a meta-analysis showing the same thing, indicating 50% chance of conceiving after surgery by numerous authors, uh, just the same data as uh, presented by Paolo Vercellini. Next slide. If you have colorectal uh, uh, endometriosis, the effect of surgery is not hampered. Even if you have severe endometriosis, this is the work of Horace Fromal, who is an expert surgeon in France, he's now in Bordeaux. And you see the two curves is with and without colorectal uh, involvement of endometriosis. And you see that the chances of conceiving are also uh, a little bit more than 50% in his case. And uh, the same, irrespective of whether you have colorectal endometriosis or not. So surgery helps natural conception. This is the message. Next slide. Surgery, however, does not help IVF. Helps natural conception, but does not help IVF. Next slide. This is uh, a, a work uh, that has uh, summarized that. Next slide. Uh, and you see here, uh, if you look at the uh, right panel, you have uh, the clinical pregnancy rate. The clinical pregnancy rate uh, is not improved uh, in women who have surgery versus control without surgery. And there is a trend for a decrease 
in antifollicular count in women who had surgery uh, as compared to controls. So surgery is not helping and therefore can even harm and surgery should not be performed before IVF. Of course, surgery can be performed for uh, pain, but surgery is only for natural conception, provided you have the time and everything else that you need for natural conception, as we will see. Next slide. Next slide. Next one. Okay, and uh, uh, surgery may actually alter the ovarian reserve. Next slide. This is the work that we had done when I was at Cochin, and we looked at uh, uh, AMH uh, in women who were undergoing surgery. To the left, you have the controls, and the right three columns are women who had superficial uh, endometrioma and deep infiltrating endometriosis. To our surprise, there were no differences. This is before surgery, no differences between the different groups. And when we further analyzed that, next slide, we showed that women, the subgroup of women who had surgery before had lower uh, AMH levels. So therefore, the message here is that it's not so much uh, the disease that's a problem, but it's really uh, the surgery for the disease, which is more harmful in terms of ovarian reserve than the disease itself. Next slide. Uh, when you do surgery in a young woman, I mean, uh, Dr. DeVos just talked about that. Uh, you have to discuss the possibility of fertility preservation pretty much like you do for cancer. If a woman has to have surgery because of uh, unmanageable pain, you have to consider endometriosis. And as Dr. DeVos said, more is better. So we sometimes recommend a dual stimulation as developed by um, Filippo Baldi in Rome. And as we've done ourselves too, more oocyte is better when you talk about fertility preservation. Next slide. Uh, now, medicine is not an exact science and there are people who have different opinions. I said, in general, People believe that surgery does not help IVF outcome. However, there are people who say the opposite. And I want to be honest. And then therefore, I showed you some data from a group that also includes Horace Roman uh, from France that suggests that in their hands, uh, surgery improved endometriosis uh, outcome uh, IVF outcome in endometriosis. Next slide. You have here the results. Uh, you have in blue uh, surgery done first and uh, IVF done uh, first in red. This is not randomized and this is again an outlier because the majority of people don't think that surgery helps IVF. But I want to be honest with you and show you this because this is done by a group of very good surgeons uh, and in their hands, surgery helped IVF. We ourselves don't believe that. And we ourselves don't do surgery before IVF. Next slide. Uh, now, diagnosis of endometriosis, this is an issue that deserves a little bit of attention because it used to be that in infertility, we would do uh, baseline before starting the workup is laparoscopy to actually assess the pelvis and diagnose, amongst other things, endometriosis. But with the success of IVF, we don't do that anymore. Most often, we don't even do a laparoscopy as part of the workup. So if we only rely on surgical diagnosis, we are going to miss uh, a lot of endometriosis. So we have to have a backup system to diagnose endometriosis besides surgery. And actually, it is in imaging that the solution com comes. And uh, you will see in the next slide, uh, this is a work by, uh, uh, next slide. This is uh, the work reported by SART and indicating an incidence of endometriosis. SART is the actual database of the US IVF system. 
of 11% in all uh, ART done in the US. And this is clearly underreported because it's only based on surgery. This is an indication that we have to have alternate means of diagnosing endometriosis. Next slide. Next one. Yeah. This is the work of Enrico Zuppi. This is fine. Enrico Zuppi indicating the value of a mapping approach to uh, ultrasound diagnosis of endometriosis. There are areas where you have to look for endometriosis and you have to provide a grid, as you see on the left, and a score. And if you do that with uh, ultrasound, as well as with MRI, you actually have a replacement system for diagnosing endometriosis. So the concept that it's only a surgical diagnosis is something from the past, something from the past. Now we have to rely on imaging because we don't do diagnostic laparoscopies anymore. And if we don't rely on imaging for diagnosing endometriosis, we are going to miss a lot of cases. Next slide. Uh, MRI also uh, needs to have a structured reporting, and it has to be done by people who are comfortable with that. And if it is the case, then you have uh, nearly the efficacy of surgery for diagnosis, deep endometriosis. The only one which is not diagnosed is superficial. Next slide. Uh, next slide. This is a meta-analysis and shows uh, the transvaginal ultrasound. This is a rock curve. And you see that all the dots are up on the left. So it's highly effective for diagnosis and endometriosis transvaginal ultrasound. Next slide. And uh, for rectal sigmoid endometriosis as well, transvaginal ultrasound is highly effective when done in a proper manner looking for all the territories where you might find endometriosis by experts' hands and eyes. Next slide. Next one. All right, this is, no, back, back. All right, so this is sensitivity and specificity of transvaginal ultrasound for rectovaginal, trans uh, ultrasound also for rectovaginal and MRI uh, for uh, endometriosis. And you see that in all the study reported, the sensitivity is nearly 100% and specificity as well. So highly effective, and we have to rely on that. Otherwise, we miss a lot of endometriosis. Uh, the concept that it was a surgical diagnosis is something of the past. Next slide. Are they uh, in non-invasive markers? Well, it would be nice if there were. There are some candidates, but none of them uh, actually is, reaches the level of being effective clinically. It's only for research. Next slide. Next one. You see that the data are very scattered. There's a lot of hope. Uh, also for non-coding mRNAs, there's a lot of hope that uh, there will be some uh, progress done. But at this stage, those non-invasive markers are only for research and not for routine. Next slide. Endometriomas and ART. Next slide. Uh, the impact of endometrioma on uh, ART in the systemic review and meta-analysis. Actually, uh, next slide. Contrary to what we believed before, uh, next one. Right, uh, you see that the endometriomas, no, go back, go back. Uh, the endometrioma uh, does not, yeah, does not impact on life growth rate, clinical pregnancy rate. It only impacts on the number of cancellations. So the endometrioma per se, uh, if you do not perforate the endometrioma during the retrieval, does not impact on life birth rate. Next slide. Now, the question is whether uh, IVF risk the flare of endometriosis. Contrary to what was said before, this is not the case. This is a study we conducted ourselves. We looked at the symptoms, pain in women with endometriosis and in controls. Next slide. 
And you see that if you go to the upper right uh, panel, the blue is endometriosis, the green is um, controls. So you see that at the first visit, uh, from the first to the second visit, there is a decrease in symptoms. This is because the patient were put on the pill, so the pill makes them feel better. But during the stimulation itself, uh, there is no difference between the controls and the endometriosis patient. So contrary to what has been said, the actual uh, ovarian stimulation does not flare the disease. Next slide. Uh, next slide. Next one. Okay, so next one. Okay, this is fine. Here you have the outcome of IVF with the fresh transfer on the left and the frozen transfer on the right, or freeze all and deferred embryo transfer. In endometriosis, and we will see this, you need to freeze all and defer the transfer for two different reasons. First of all, the agonist trigger is less dramatic. And second of all, you have a better implantation rate. And I will tell you why, at least the hypothesis that we have to explain that. Next slide. Uh, if you do IVF with endometriomas in place, there is a risk of complication and there is a risk of abscesses. Next slide. We did conduct a study when I was at Cochin to try to determine the actual, next one, the actual risk. Uh, and this was conducted by assessing the number of women uh, hospitalized with uh, acute pelvic infection and a diagnosis of endometriosis over a four year period at our institution. Next slide. We had in total 10 cases, next one, 10 cases but of the 10 cases, only the, no, the back, only the first three uh, had uh, IVF. The other seven did not have IVF. So actually, the concept is that endometriosis, endometriomas are a cause of infection, even if you don't do IVF. So you have to be careful. And when you have a late occurrence of infection uh, after IVF, it may actually not be IVF itself. It may have occurred anyway, just because of the endometrioma. It, if it happens, however, it's a serious disorder, you have to, most of the time, do a laparoscopy and wash the ovaries in order to avoid having to do a uh, ovariectomy. And so you have to be very prompt with doing the laparoscopy. Next slide. Implantation, as I said, the utopic endometrium is altered in endometriosis, and there have been a lot of reports indicating that implantation is impaired. Next slide. Now, what you have is this. Uh, in the normal system, you have estradiol goes to the uterus and induces what it's supposed to do. But in case of endometriosis, the situation, because of inflammation, is different, and because of two reasons. A, there is a local production of estradiol, to activation of the CYP19 or the aromatase. And second, there is a resistance to progesterone. So therefore, uh, the uterus is uh, essentially poorly receptive in case of endometriosis. However, if the ovaries are suppressed, we don't exactly know how, but if the ovaries are suppressed by either the agonist or the pill, this alteration of the utopic endometrium are reverted to normal. And you will see that probably that estradiol and progesterone for frozen embryo transfer also reverts uh, the utopic endometrium. Next slide. Uh, this is the work by Bruce Lissy on uh, trying to have a marker for this receptivity. However, uh, this may not be true uh, reflection because the study was on small number of patients. It led to a test that's available in the US, but uh, clearly the number of cases is too small, so we cannot tell that this is truly reflecting uh, receptivity. We put it there just for sake of being complete. Next slide. So what you have is the effect of endometriosis on ART. We believed before that endometriosis harmed ART it resulted in poor embryos. I told you that this is not the case. The euploidy rate is the same. And I will show you now that if you do frozen embryo transfer, 
there is no alteration of receptivity. So this is the article, the uh, editorial uh, article that we wrote a couple of months ago. The effect of endometriosis on ART, gone with the wind. It's over. We don't believe anymore. Uh, and that's my true belief that endometriosis harms ART outcome, provided that, A, you make the diagnosis of endometriosis properly with imaging, if you don't do surgery, and two, if you have endometriosis, then you have to have uh, a agonist trigger and freeze all the embryos and deferred embryo transfer. Next slide. This is the work that uh, the editorial was related to by Mika Hill, Kate Devine. Uh, and actually, uh, it shows that in their hands, next slide, uh, in their hands, the uh, implantation rate of euploid blastocyst was not different in endometriosis in blue, as it were in male factor in yellow, or PGTM in, in gray. Neither was the clinical pregnancy loss. So if you take uh, the effort of freezing all the embryos as it had done when you do euploidy testing uh, by PGTA, actually you correct the issue of implantation. This is why we got this concept that the impact of endometriosis on ART is gone with the wind. It's over. Next slide. So come to the conclusion in practical management. Next slide. You see in red at the two extreme in terms of age, uh, when surgery is being performed, whereas in green is the time when ART prevails. If you have a young woman and uh, she has a good iron reserve, you can do surgery. But in most of the time when women, women come to our consultation, they are 35 or sometimes even older. And at that time, you cannot do surgery because if you do surgery, you have to let the person conceive naturally for two years. And she only has 50% chance of conceiving. But two years later, ART outcome is going to be severely decreased. So you don't want to waste that time. Next slide. So this is the last slide, and I wanted to summarize the management. Uh, when you do the infertility workup, you actually uh, diagnose endometriosis, either by surgery or by imaging now. And I remind you of this. Do your imaging if you suspect endometriosis, if you have dysmenorrhea, dyspareunia. Do your proper imaging, ultrasound and MRI. Now, if you have at that stage with endometriosis, if the patient is young, if she has a good ovarian reserve, if there is not a tumor factor, and if the sperm is good, because I give you, uh, you know, I give you a scoop for a pregnancy, you need sperm as well. So all of that is good. Then you can conceive to do surgery, and then make a deal with the patient that then she's going to try to conceive at home for the next eighteen months. If, however, as most of the time it is, the woman is in the age of 35 or so, the ovarian reserve is compromised, or if you have a tumor factor, or if the sperm is not good, don't do surgery. You do ART. And again, surgery does not help ART. And if you do ART, uh, you uh, do uh, freeze all and deferred embryo transfer. Last slide, next. There are, as in all rules, there are exceptions. Uh, if you have a hydrosalpinx, the hydrosalpinx is going to impair uh, ART outcome, and you have to remove that. And in several cases with low ovarian reserve, we sometimes do a uh, salpingectomy without touching the endometriosis because we don't want the harm of ovarian reserve. If you have a very large endometrioma, sometimes you have to do surgery nonetheless because you cannot access the follicles. So it's not a question of truly a size cutoff, but it's more an issue of whether you can have access to the follicles or not. So I hope I've entertained you about the management of endometriosis and the 
two new uh, principles is that endometriosis is diagnosed by imaging uh, as we don't do surgery anymore. The second uh, principle is that uh, oocyte quality uh, when you do IVF is not impaired. It is impaired in natural conception. And lastly, when you do uh, free zole and deferred embryo transfer, the estradiol and progesterone regimen blocks the ovaries and the receptivity is not impaired, as I showed you in the last uh, article that came out just a couple of months ago. So the impact of endometriosis, as we said in our editorial, is gone with the wind. I thank you very much. Next slide. This is again our people at Hospital uh, uh, Foch. And I thank you very much for listening to me. And sorry that you don't see me. Uh, if you had seen me, you would have seen that I have enough gray hair to have had experience in this field. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Desiglier. Uh, some uh, questions or opinion about the operation or uh, ART from audience? Ah, yeah, there's a one Maybe question. nobody understood anything. Yeah, there's a question from the audience. Uh, Professor De Ziegler, in your research, do you have any observation on how endometriosis affect pregnancy, not conception? Right, this is an excellent question. Excellent question. You have to realize, well, first of all, the data. If you look at a uh, outcome in endometriosis, there are numerous papers indicating that you have an increased incidence of miscarriages and increased incidence of various problems uh, during the pregnancy and including uh, preeclampsia. Now, the true issue is whether you have differences between complication in ART and in uh, natural conception. In natural conception, remember that the embryo has been exposed for a short time, but has been exposed to a toxic environment. And we know that even the short-term exposure uh, of the embryo can actually have a lasting effect on its uh, outcome. Also, we don't have the information now, but it would be interesting to know whether uh, there is a uh, difference between the obstetrical outcome uh, of uh, the um, natural of the uh, IVF with fresh and deferred embryo transfer. Uh, we don't have that information. Uh, it might be uh, interesting to know if uh, it was uh, better with uh, frozen embryo transfer. There's another question. Uh, do you recommend DAO regulation before commencing embryo transfer? We used to. We used to. And we actually, uh, the, the work of uh, William Schoolcraft and Eric Surrey had reported that a three to six months done regulation with the agonist was helpful. We ourselves published some three or, or maybe five years ago that using the pill for six to nine weeks was actually uh, helping. Today, with the advent of uh, cryopreservation by vitrification, we don't believe this anymore is necessary. We believe that the proper option is to actually do an antagonist cycle because you don't want to have a hyperstimulation with endometriosis. You want to you don't want you want to avoid that antagonist cycle, agonist trigger, and freezeol and deferred embryo transfer. This is the better approach now uh, over the uh, down regulation that existed before. This is what we do now. Thank you, Professor De Ziegler. Professor Sterev, there are no other questions in written. No other question. Uh, I wish uh, Professor Ziegler next year when uh, no COVID-19 visit Bulgaria for the... I hope so. Online. I hope so. <laughs> I hope so. I hope so. Bye-bye.
Bye-bye. Bye.